was recorded live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for the 22nd Annual International Association of Square Dance Callers. This is tape number 15, Sound Enhancement. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bill Hyman, and I'm delighted to be moderating today's panel. We have two other panelists, one of whom is Doreen Sillery and her husband, Doreen. Off to my left, your right, and she is very busy unpacking some additional equipment. And Jack Murtha is our other panelist. Would you like to join us up here? Come on up. Come on up. There is, there is one request that I have to make, and that is that the... Uh, that is that this session is being recorded for those people who might want to uh, hear the information imparted here and also are, they are going to be particularly interested in your questions because your questions are probably the same questions that they would like to ask but they're not here so it's really imperative that you join us at the mic down the center of the aisle and uh, we would uh, then be able to get all of that information onto the tape for those who couldn't be here today and I do thank you very much um, if just a quick comment, I will probably just repeat it, but let's try and, try and use the microphones down the center. The focus of today's uh, discussion, and this really is a discussion much more than a presentation, is sound enhancement systems. As you probably know, this is a very, very interesting and unique area of sound equipment. And what I would like to do is just to make some very brief opening comments. I would then like to pass the microphone on to our two other panelists for comments that may, they may have to make. And then I have some additional information, and I will cite to you the pamphlets and information that are available in front. There's enough, there are more than enough pamphlets, pamphlets for everybody here. And I also brought along, and I printed them out on my laser printer on the back of my information sheet, which is entitled, The What, Why, and How Much of Personal Sound Enhancement Systems. On the back of that, I've also taken the Caller Lab graphic design, and frankly, I just cleaned it up on my computer a little bit since my printer is a little bit sharper than whoever printer did it originally. And I uh, have those, and those are on the back, and you are free to photocopy as many of those as you might need for clubs or other organizations in your area. It's with our great pleasure. Um, what I'd like to do uh, first is just take a quick survey. How many of you in the room are currently using sound enhancement systems of any kind? All right, Doreen is, and one. Okay, we have three and four. Jack, I know, is using four. Those of you who are using personal receivers, are you turned to channel three? If you have a multiple channel unit, just turn to three and you should hear my voice as I'm talking, okay? And you can adjust the individual volumes, and this is probably a good example here. You can adjust the individual volumes on each set. Each one has its own volume so that you can do it. And as you will see, there are different kinds of earpieces and different kinds of headsets that are available for this. The, um, were any of you in attendance at the Sound Enhancement Committee meeting, which took place at 10, whatever it was this morning? Or? One, yeah, 115. I'm sorry, the, the period prior to this. Okay, very good. Um, what I would like to do, and I do have some uh, brief comments towards the end, is I would perhaps like to start off uh, with Jack, and if Jack, I know Jack has some specific comments he'd like to make, but maybe you could also include in that a brief comment on the history of the committee and how it started originally and now with Doreen as chair. Well, let me take just a minute on the history of it first so you get a concept of what has brought this all about. Um, Four or five years ago, I received a phone call from a square dancer in the Midwest. And this square dancer uh, was a member of an organization called SHHHH, uh, which is an organization for hard of hearing people. And he had been a square dancer for a long time using a hearing aid to help him until it got to the point where his hearing was so... Uh, bad that the hearing aid no longer did the job. A hearing aid picks up everything in the way of noise that's going on in a room. It's not selective. It doesn't just pick out what you want to hear. You hear everything louder that's in the room. And for a long time, his hearing aid was adequate to square dance with. But as his hearing progressively got worse, the room noise at a square dance began to overpower the caller's voice and music in his hearing aid, and he had to virtually quit square dancing. Then he found some equipment, and uh, in those days, he must have had quite a few contacts, but he found some equipment used for sound enhancement to help people uh, 
hear amplified sound through a transmitter and a receiver, a personal receiver. And his organization was having a big convention at Stanford University. So he phoned me up and asked me if I'd come down and help them put on a one-night stand for uh, people that couldn't hear using this sound equipment to test it out. And he had companies, two or three different companies there with equipment. They brought all kinds of receivers and set up their uh, transmitters. And we got outside on one of the basketball courts and and tried to encourage some people to take one of those receivers and try square dancing, which they'd never done before. And it, we got eight brave people that came out and formed one square to try this out. And uh, it went great. They did well. And so then they got another and another. And before we finished the evening, I had eight squares on the floor, every one of them with a personal receiver trying to hear. And we had a good time. So uh, that was my introduction to all of this, and he went back, of course, to his club and was able to rejoin his club, start square dancing again, and, and it just was terrific. Shortly after that, while we got involved in doing some other things with the sound enhancement equipment, and finally I wrote to the Colorado Board of Governors and suggested to them that uh, this was something that was important to square dancing and was going to be coming, and we ought to get ahead of the game and set up a committee, so they appointed me chairman of it, and we set up a committee and started working on uh, this idea. We had terrific guys like Bill who said uh, he put in some equipment in his catalog and in uh, his business that uh, would help us, and he, as we started investigating, we called every company that produced this equipment and invited them to our Color Lab convention in Florida. Uh, not all of them would send representatives. Some of us let us know that this just didn't sound like enough business to be worth their effort to send people back to do this. But uh, some people did come. There were people there from Telex. There were people there from uh, Williams, the main two ones that came. And we had quite a good discussion to try and understand what all of this equipment was and what it did. We also got some fascinating feedback from other places overseas and in, in uh, I'm not sure exactly where it was now. I think of Belgium, but I'm not sure that's right. But some overseas callers had found other ways to deal with this. They had worked out ways that people who have a hearing aid with a T-switch on it could pick up from a room loop that they made of wire that picked up these transmissions and relayed them to the hearing aids. Uh, we've found that some people have even uh, figured out how to use one of those baby room monitors that uh, are very expensive, and you can pick up a room monitor that people put in a room where a baby is so that it starts crying while it, it transmits to a hearing system. So we've learned all kinds of things about things people are doing. These aren't things we invented. They're just things people wrote us about or phoned us to let us know they were doing. And uh, so that's basically how all of this got started. And we've been now working on it for a couple of years. And last year we made a big jump forward because with Doreen's help, uh, they put this equipment in at the Collar Lab convention in Canada and made arrangements to put it in at the uh, National Convention in Portland. Now, that was all through one company's willingness to work with us. We found that there's a lot of different things going on, and some companies uh, really weren't all that helpful. Although they were ready to sell equipment, uh, they weren't really keyed into what it would mean in terms of square dancing. Uh, for some reason, the people we got in contact with at the one company were very interested in uh, what our application was, what we were doing with this, because it was new to them. And we talked to them, and Doreen has since talked to them quite a little bit. And they actually, after they heard what we needed, made special arrangements to help us use their equipment in ways other companies wouldn't uh, let us use it. Uh, a major problem developed early in the game where we put these uh, sound enhancement 
transmitters into two or three different halls in a given festival. And as soon as they turned them on, they all conflicted with each other. And they had to go back and turn off two of them. They could only use one in one room because they were all broadcasting on the same channel. And at that time, we didn't have any idea what you could do about that. There were tunable receivers. We had purchased and had people buy tunable receivers that would tune to different re channels, but there was no way to tune the transmitters. You bought a transmitter to transmit on a certain channel, and if you wanted it to, trans to transmit on another channel, you had to send it back to the factory, and they put a different crystal in it and sent it back to you, and then you could use a different channel. So anyway, we've continued this relationship tremendously under uh, Doreen's leadership. And uh, at this stage of the game, our area is increasingly uh, finding more and more clubs buying equipment. And many of them tell us that they haven't had any problem at all buying it. They uh, let people know what they're doing, and they set up a fundraiser. One of our clubs uh, has a 50-50 every club night, and the club's part of it all goes into the fund for buying hearing equipment. Uh, others had a raffle. Somebody else set up a booth at a fair. And many of the groups that decided they wanted this equipment went out and found ways to buy, to raise the money to buy it pretty quickly. We advise people to shop uh, because you can find the same item in many different places uh, at different prices. And so on our committee, we've tried to take the position that we want to let everybody know everything we can about the equipment and help them know how to go about uh, contacting people and find the best situation they can find. Having people like Bill, who said he was selling one set of equipment, and uh, we talked to him, and he said, uh, sure, we'll put in some other equipment if, we're, if that's a better deal for the dancers. And so he, now how many do you have? Four? Uh -huh. And so um, that kind of covers the history of this. The thing I wanted mostly to do, and I'll take just a minute more to do this, I asked some of the people that are using these in our clubs to write me a, a letter or a note telling me about how this was working out for them. I have one here that uh, I won't try to read the whole thing, but I'll read enough of it so you get a sense of what this person feels. Jack, here are some ramblings of thoughts that I have in reference to the hearing enhancement equipment. When we started to square dance, I knew I had a hearing problem, but would try anyhow. Maybe I would hear okay. In a small, quiet gymnasium, it was okay. But when we started to visit other dances, I found out the acoustics varied widely as well as sound systems. The worst acoustics were at the Yuba City Fairgrounds, our main area for a big dance, <laughs> in the uh, main hall. And uh, the, the main hall's terrible. Then we went to the Silver Dollar Fairgrounds in Chico, where Bill Keyes, one of the first callers in Northern California to get this equipment. And he bought Williams' equipment uh, when everybody else was buying Telex. I'm not sure exactly why. I think he had a local dealer that sold that. And um, he had the FM equipment for hearing impaired. I tried a receiver, and what a terrific help. He had it operating to hear the call and not the music, which I can hear the beat anyway. And all the echoes in the building were obliterate, obliterated to my hearing, and it was great. Then shortly afterwards, I obtained my own receiver, which has been a great investment. Now I call ahead to see if the dances are going to have the equipment. If not, I think strongly about whether I'm going to go or not. Types of transmitters and receivers I've encountered, and then he goes on to list numbers of equipment and prices. And uh, I hope this is what you wanted. You may use any of the thoughts here or expand on them. It's just I'd just like to help anyone who is having problems hearing the caller from uh, this one dancer that uses it. And I have several dancers in clubs there that follow this procedure now that they check ahead and if a, call, if, a, if a dance does not advertise or plan to use this kind of equipment, they don't go to the dance. 
They select dances only now that have this kind of equipment because their hearing problems have been severe enough that they, they uh, and this works so well, makes a difference. Doreen has made the comment that in some places, even people that don't have a hearing problem use this equipment uh, because of the awful acoustics in the hall. And there is no hall with bad acoustics if you're wearing a set of this equipment. So that even in places where they got in the back of the hall and had a miserable time, they went up and picked up a loner and used it through the dance and worked great. An interesting comment from some people in Bill Key's club. Uh, the guys driving to the dance put on their receiver about two miles or so away from the dance to find out if it started yet or what they're doing for the rounds. <laughs> so... Uh, but it's been well accepted by people who have had a chance to try it that have a hearing problem. If you have a hearing problem, uh, this really has made a difference in terms of square dancing. Okay. Thank you very much, Jack. That was very, very informative. Uh, Doreen, would you like to jump in now? If I'm going to use notes, if you don't mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, while we were at Color Lab a few years ago, we saw demonstrations of two hearing, assist hearing assistance systems. I was immediately drawn to them as I am teaching about 500 seniors a day and I knew a few had problems with hearing all the calls and then there were those who wore hearing aids. Unfortunately I could not afford the $700 needed to purchase the unit. Looking back now I'm glad that I did not as I have learnt much. Later Jack Murtha headed a color lab committee to view the models and the makes available at that time and make an unbiased report. Since I was president of the British Columbia Square and Round Dance Federation, which is like your state council, it was important that I receive as much critical information so that I could inform the callers and dancers of the province. What was the most dependable make and what frequencies would be the most stable? Could we interchange with other makes? What happened when we moved from one part of the country to another or another club? What would happen if two side-by-side -side rooms at a convention were using the system? When I knew that Jack was working on this research, I phoned him on occasion as I was most anxious to introduce the system to my our, our dancers. Jack tried to give an unbiased, as unbiased a report as possible, but I tried to listen between the lines and came to the conclusion that the Williams sound was the best make and 72.9 megahertz the preferred wide band and 72.1 the second best. There have been some new models, and until I arrived here today, I had not seen the new one, which is this one. Perhaps you have, um, it, it is most important to see some of the newer makes and models. Perhaps you have access and information, and we would like you to assist us on that. The American Disabilities Act is now a reality in the United States, which means a person needing hearing enhancement can be and must be given such equipment on demand. But I understand that there are some exceptions, which I learned today. When I heard of such an act while I was in Portland for the convention, I expected that there would be an advancement in technology and more firms demanding a piece of the market. And we like, I'd like to hear more about it here. The average age of our square and round dancers is getting older, and thus more are suffering from various amounts of hearing loss. But then I know of some younger dancers who are also thrilled with the system. In 1991, I bought the first transmitter and three receivers in our area myself. Since I am teaching morning, noon, and night, it was important that I have my own system. No one wants to be the first to try to put a device in their ear. Will it hurt? Is it much better than my new hearing aids that cost $2,000? Fortunately for me, a dancer who prides himself on his appearance was the first to try and to purchase. Since he was so excited with the results, four others immediately ventured forth. The advantage is over the regular hearing aids. Well, the plug is put into the good ear. There are no outside noises, just pure direct sound coming through. But the system is only good to the dancer if the record is playing and or the microphone is used. It is not good for talking to someone else on the floor. Each dancer controls his or her volume. One of our British Columbia callers, a caller lab member, has been absolutely terrific since he is and was bringing the units in on his business license and, sold and sells them to us at his cost. 
Susan Hellier, an audiologist and round a member living and teaching in the state of Washington, asked her friend in Vancouver, Canada, to give us the square dancing recreation the same price, which means no profit for her company. Very special, I would say. Quite often dancers have left the recreation because they cannot hear properly. One phoned me and asked me if it was true that I had this hearing unit. He had stopped square dancing because he could not hear and didn't like to inconvenience the others in the square, but still round danced. He came, listened, and was sold. His round dance leader would not buy, so he purchased the transmitter also and takes it everywhere. That leader has since purchased his own through some fundraising. If no transmitter is set up, he supplies his. He immediately went back square dancing also. How does one know if a particular club has a unit? And if so, what about the frequency? An ear symbol with a frequency number next to it will tell the story in the club ad or the dance flyer. In other words, you put it in your unit, there it is. Uh, and so you put the frequency right next to it. Some clubs have raised money through 50-50 draws and fundraisers to buy the transmitter, and others have also subsidized the cost of personal receivers. Dancers tell me the $100 Canadian, difference in our dollars, that is, is a small price to pay for such excellent sound, allowing them to continue in their, our favorite recreation. We spend hours and dollars to recruit dancers. This is one small way we can keep the dancers dancing longer. They are already trained. The range is great. This was well demonstrated three years ago when we all had a great laugh when at one of my semi-annual workshop camps, Vera left early to go to her cabin a fair distance away as her session finished early. And in the comfort of her bed, listen to what we were doing in the hall, lying there, and with great glee told us about it the next morning. I have learned much about the system from what the dancers tell me and from what they asked. The units used at the community dance yesterday and available here today have been loaned to us through William Sound in Minnesota, as they did in Vancouver in 1994. There have been some changes in the transmitter. I have the original black box, but the newer units have become more streamlined and advanced and easier to use as this one is now. It's just terrific. The latest transmitter changes on the outside. It is so easy. The receivers, three as I prepare this. One is a one receiver, frequency receiver. One is four, 72.9 is number three, 72.1 is number one. And the third has six. Pouches that clip on the belt are also available or one can make a little pouch to coordinate with a dress, either with buttons, Velcro, or to hang on a belt. One comes with, oh, nine volt batteries are needed and I purchased this, these when there's a good sale. One comes with each receiver. It is recommended that each receiver, each user rather, purchase their own receiver. Earphone. Some of you have the single plug, eh? A single plug is put in the ear, or one can use the duo mono earphone set. And since, since we were here last, they now have this new one that fits over the ear and over the top of the ear without going into the ear, and that's the one I think you have, Carmen. Also, you can get that little plug take into your hearing aid place and have it set into a hearing thing that some people have. You know, they can make it, set it in there, it fits right into the ear. There's also, ear mold, that's the word, yeah. And there's also an accordion thing that fits over that, and I didn't bring it. I thought William Sound might send it, but they didn't. And it fits sort of in the ear and it doesn't fall out. Uh, for some, the ears are big and they fit in, and others, they just don't quite fit in. Um... Now, any set of Walkman-type plugs can be adapted by getting a stereo to mono adapter. Then the mono can come out of both ears. Williams Sound has also these sets. Radio Shack has had an adapter, and I've got the number here, and I've got copies of this for anyone who wants it. Uh, it tells you what to do. Take your earphones with you when you get this adapter, though. Uh, the sound in the hall is not so good, but has an echo, as Jack said. But usually you can hear just fine without assistance. Buy the receiver and use the dual earphones so that you do not get any outside noise from the exposed good ear. Because if you have a plug here, this ear is still good. And if you cover both ears and have the sound coming out into both ears with a mono plug, then you're not going to have outside interference. 
the sound does not come from the speaker for you then. It comes, well, where's the speaker in here? Okay, down there. It comes from directly from the transmitter. You're not having to listen to the echo. That club has a different system, a different brand name. As long as it is on a recognizable frequency, you can use it. I've had Tolex people come in and with the same frequency, use it. Changes. Now you own a one frequency transmitter and you want to change it. Just one stroke changes between the two best rated, 72.9 to 72.1. And all you have to do, can I have a one channel one, Donna? There's one down there. Is just open the back. Open, whoops. I keep this one. <laughs> you have to open the back up like a book. It only takes half a second. And with a little screwdriver, I had to buy mine at the uh, sewing machine place, but uh, Color Lab has a one for 50 cents upstairs. You can just turn. That's all. All you have to do is that. And in that little place right there, put a screwdriver and listen to what's going on. Tune it. And you've got it. And you can turn it any which way you want. That's all you have to do is open it up like a book. You will need a small screwdriver. I got mine from the sewing machine outlet. Now, you have a one-channel... Uh, oh, you have a one-channel receiver and the frequency being used. Well, okay, I've got that done. Doyne and I have tried as many possibilities as we know to connecting the sound system to our Hiltons, etc. And since the Hiltons are being used here... I think we should have a little discussion on that because we have, um, okay, because we use it a certain way. Um, and I think we should decide between the three of us here. A question often asked, can I use the same system at the theater? The theaters, etc., use an infrared system, which means that a direct line between transmission and receiver is necessary. Since the dancer is moving around so much, this would pose a problem. There may be more recent technology, and we want to know what any of you know. The committee dealing with hearing enhancement is anxious to know of recent developments, cautions with connecting to our main transmitter, so please tell us of your experiences. We are listening and want to know more, but do let your dancers know of this very important technology. I also have sheets there to describe the infrared and the, our systems, the differences of them, and four different systems on the back of the sheet at the front. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doreen. Um, let me just break at this point. Are there questions on the subjects covered so far? I have some more things to cover, but are there subjects, uh, questions, excuse me, uh, that we would like to touch on now? Anything from the floor? Please. Could I ask you to step to the microphone? Thanks. Well, my name is Ray Wilson. I'm from Sardinia, Ohio. I call, started calling back in the early 50s, and as uh, time progresses, I find my hearing is diminished. And I've done things to try to overcome that by using monitors and so forth. Uh, can these be used by a caller, for example, to, for me to better hear the music? Surely. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll, I'll talk about the wiring in a moment, but, but let me at least touch on it right now. You have on most of the more modern Hiltons, that would include any of the 75 or beyond models. This happens to be a 201. You have a, an RCA phono jack on the front deck uh, on all except the 201. It's tape music is the front left-hand corner, right in the corner, and tape voice is the far right-hand corner. It's the same on both 75s and the 300s. And you either can combine those, which is, I believe, a, a less desirable choice, or you can go right to the voice channel for dancers. The question you ask is exactly the opposite. In your particular case, you really are using that as a pu personal music monitor, and what you would want to do is, in that case, hook it up to the music channel, because that's all you're interested in. The problem with that would be is that if that is also the system that is broadcasting out on the floor, you're sort of gaining a disadvantage by putting music out to the floor, too. So you, you might want to think, quite frankly, uh, not to sell equipment, but you might actually want to think about a music monitor channel, channel for yourself, and then if you're providing that service for the dancers, then have a voice channel only. The problem uh, with most people is that they want to hear the voice commands, as we all know, most of us are callers in here. They want to hear the voice commands. They can get the music by the vibrations out through the room, ambient sound in the hall, and so forth. And quite frankly, even if they don't hear the music, if you have your choice between hearing clear vocal commands 
and inadequately clear vocal commands mixed in with music, I think you're really much better off depriving the person of the music, and I, it pains me to say that, but there, there are real choices there, and give them at least the voice commands. They will get the rhythm from the rest of the square dancing, assuming that you have some decent dancers dancing with them. They can pick up that music, and you're starting with the circle to the left, and they get in the rhythm and the beat of the music. I don't think that would be a problem per se. Having said that, most of the people that I have met who are hearing impaired, in fact, can hear ambient sound, even though they're having difficulty hearing the vocal mid-range, they do hear the ambient sound in the hall, or at the very least, the throb of the bass beat. And that, once again, is the key, not enjoyment component of the music, but that's obviously the key dancing component, is that to get that bass beat line. Let me take a step back. If, as in fact, let me just seal one of these, and if you can just hand those out, that would be great. I'm passing out a, a page. Uh, it's actually a page out of our catalog, and I've, I've decommercialized it and pulled, pulled as much as I could off. There's no 800 number on it. Uh, th we've been publishing this for a number of years now. Let me just take one step back to uh, our involvement in this. Actually, prior to the establishment of this community, I'm certainly not claiming that I was the one who started this in this community, but back in 1983, when we purchased one of the companies that we bought, I was already looking at this, and in 84, I actively started it, and uh, that's when we picked up, in fact, the Telex uh, wireless microphone systems and uh, shortly talked with the area rep about uh, the sound enhancement system. I think if you look back in your 1985 National Square Dance Directory on the rear cover, you'll see an ad for this very system. And the problem has been in the past, frankly, the money, and I think that Jack addressed that particularly well, that the clubs, as, as knowledge increased due to the, the work of the various people involved in the Sound Enhancement Committee, as the awareness of the equipment availability has increased, the willingness to spend money, and it's, it's actually not even more expensive now than it was then, the willingness to spend money is significantly increasing. And there are a lot of people doing it. We find ourselves providing these sound enhancement systems to two categories. One is the individual dancer, who can, is able to afford a system like this on their own, out of their own pocket, and are just so interested in dancing that they're simply willing to spend five, six, seven hundred dollars to have their own system. And then there are the others referred to by Jack just a moment ago, and those are the clubs or dancers associations or callers who recognize that this is a great marketing tool, and quite frankly, that's what got Peggy and me interested in this uh, back in 84, 85, and that is the marketing side. I am, by training, a marketeer. I'm not an engineer. I'm a marketeer. I'm a marketing kind of guy. And I was saying to myself, as our dancing population ages, they will be more and more in need of this kind of equipment, one, on a maintenance of population as the demographics change, and secondly, you would then be able to attract a whole new segment of the population by going into more of the senior, uh, senior uh, community or, in fact, uh, hearing impaired people. If you could just join me on this sheet of paper just for a moment. I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, I basically tell you in here how the system works, and it's really in incredibly simple. It is the opposite direction of a cure's or caller's wireless microphone system. Normally, the cure or the caller is out on the floor with a lapel or a head worn, perhaps a handheld mic. They transmit from that object to a receiver up on the podium, and it goes into the microphone input jack in Hilton. Most of us know that. This is the exact opposite direction. In this case, we take audio out of the unit, put it into a transmitter up at the uh, sound system, and broadcast out to the various receivers on the floor. As Doreen mentions, mentioned, they come in single channel, four channel, or six channel. If you're doing a lot of traveling, while it's certainly very easy to pop the unit open and adjust the channel, I would strongly urge anybody to buy a multiple channel unit. It's just going to be easier over time, and those little little controls in there that you do have to turn, they do actually, they're, they're, not, real, uh, they're not real hardy souls. They're not hardy like a switch would be, and over a period of time, you, there is some risk involved in that, especially if you're not careful with it. Uh, so you've got those uh, single four or six channel uh, units, uh, receivers, and then here is the new transmitter. This happens to be from Williams, and this is the only multiple channel transmitter. This is a six channel transmitter, and it's my understanding from Shelley Wickerin out at uh, um, Williams, who is the sales rep, that uh, in fact it was due to a great extent by input from this committee that they decided that it was worthwhile to do the circuitry and put the switch in, and that is the reason why there was a six-channel unit. And when I was getting this one, she didn't even know what the price was at that time. She had no literature on it and all that. It really was built, almost custom-built, for this community. Can I just say one thing? Uh, William Sound promised that I would have some printed material here on this equipment, uh, on this particular transmitter. Uh, they, she phoned me on Thursday and said she didn't have time to send it home, but it would be here. And We've been checking the mail. So if you're interested in that, keep asking us when you see us, and I will give you it when I get it. 
Thanks. And he will have it. Thank you, and it, it, I'll have it up at the booth anyway. Um, as far as hooking the unit up, it is so incredibly simple. The antenna just screws onto the top. It's in a hole with a little threaded base in there. There is a regular AC power adapter, a little cube that goes into the wall. There is a single RCA phono jack in the back. You take a single channel cable and go into your Hilton or whatever you might have, and you turn the switch on on your receiver, and you're done. It takes less than a minute to set the whole system up. It's an absolute no-brainer requires no technical knowledge at all. You just have to remember to read the jacks on the front of your system and make sure that you're plugging into the correct jack. The other thing is that the, um, uh, you do have to have some spare batteries around. These batteries do last an incredibly long time, but if somebody runs out of batteries in the middle of your dance, you should be the one to have a couple of batteries tucked in your case because they're going to look up to you, and it's going to certainly enhance you at your dance. Uh, those are, as far as the physical components, those are the components. It's, it's really as simple as that. This happens to be a telex transmitter, and you notice it's a slightly different frequency, and it has a somewhat different antenna uh, method on it. It hooks up exactly the same way. There's no difference. It has a regular power module just like this, a slightly different cable that plugs into the uh, inputs on the, um, uh, the output, excuse me, on the uh, Hilton system, and the prices of these are virtually identical. Telex has been in this business a long time, too, and Williams has been in it uh, for a very long time, and it's, it's basically that kind of equipment is their exclusive business. The third company that is available is Gentner. We happen to be authorized sales agents for Gentner. I have to be quite candid with you. Uh, haven't sold a whole bunch of them. Uh, we are actually pulling it out of our catalog next year, not because it's not good equipment. It's wonderful equipment, in fact, but because of the publicity that Williams has received, very favorable publicity, A, due to this committee's work, and B, due to its superb performance at the two events that Doreen mentioned before. You know, there were a couple of hundred people who experienced it at those various conventions. Uh, Williams is certainly clearly ahead as far as the awareness in the market. I have personally tested in both directions, using both transmitters and both receivers, actually all three transmitters and all three receivers, although the technologies differ slightly, they are in fact practically fully compatible. I could not find a channel that I couldn't receive correctly on, on the opposite brand using one brand, trans, brand A transmitter, brand, brand B uh, receiver, and so forth, so that there really are, there ought to be no concerns in that category, that if you buy one brand, you go to a different area, you know, can I receive it? My experience has been that they are, in fact, completely compatible. Um, on the cost side, basically, the um, transmitters start around 70, $79, go up to $137, once again, in both of them, and I, uh, I'm not here to sell equipment to you quite candidly, but after this uh, event, I will uh, gladly share with you some uh, price information. Uh, categorically, the, transmit, uh, the transmitters uh, cost in the 520 to 550, 570 range. So that's the kind of investment you're looking at. In both cases, the companies have slightly packaged bargain prices. If you have the one transmitter and uh, three receivers, four receivers, there are some reduced prices on that. And Telex is actually even running a special now. If you buy the combination package, you get two receivers free. Um, the, uh, so there are some promotional things that do happen occasionally in the industry. Uh, the technology is simple. It's simply an FM transmitter. It's just like your regular FM station, except it's on FCC reserved frequencies. There were eight basic frequencies, and there were actually, I believe, if, if you look at the narrow band, I believe there are 36 or 38 official frequencies on which they're allowed to broadcast. These are reserved frequencies. You will not get fuel oil trucks on it police departments, uh, taxi dispatch, and the other kinds of radio users. These are specifically reserved for hearing impaired. It's actually one of the few segments of the radio spectrum that is really reserved for one very specific purpose uh, other than some police, police and military activity, to say the least. Um, we talked about the switchability of frequencies. Uh, Doreen covered that. Are there any questions on the, the physical components of transmitter, receivers, or anything else? Yes, please. If you could step up to the mic, thank you. Uh, my name is Carmen Somarelli. I'm with, Ron, uh, with Rondelab. I attended Doreen's meeting this morning as an observer. I have one question. You talk about uh, that most uh, hearing impaired people would rather hear voice, the voice directions. Now, if a hearing impaired individual walks into a dance and he has hearing aids in his ears, he takes them out. My, my observation would be that he can't hear. He won't be able to hear. But now he's going to stick up, stick in one of these things in his ear, and he's going to hear a voice. I'm not. I don't share that optimism you sh you have with the music. I guess people who have da danced it, and you've talked to them, they do they do well. But it seems to me that the music is equally important to the to the voice direction. 
I, you're absolutely correct. I don't really challenge that, and I hope, I hope that I phrased it carefully enough because you know, I am a caller and teacher, and I am heavily into music and heavily into musical phrasing, and I do think that the music is the driving thing, and the thing that people notice most about my calling is my music programming. Not my, I, I understand that, but if you have your choice, you, you really have three choices. You have music only, just the technical side of it. You have music only, you have voice only, or a blend of those two. Okay? And blending those two coming out of these systems gives you less control as to how much voice there is. And all I, all I was saying is, it's not a wonderful alternative, but given the three that we have, my feeling is that that is the better choice. Having said that, I know a lot of people, and I believe you blend, do you blend both or do you do I voice only? Mine, but I'm yeah. not one of these ones that turns my yeah. voice and my yeah. music up and down. Yeah. Now, even if the people are running the music up and down, the output on these are constant so that they don't have to run their volume controls up and down. Okay, and re remember, everybody does have an individual volume control, so they really can control it. And they also will not go up too loud. You know, they, they do have uh, limiters in them so that they won't go up and hurt somebody. Let me address one other... Uh, excuse me, I, I didn't mean to walk off that subject, but, but those, those seem to be the issues that are, that are facing us and, and the available choices. If you can get it, and, and rounds are perhaps an unusual combination, okay, and they, the voice is more blended and probably of more even nature to go in with the music, and in the case of the rounds, that, that might be a better choice. In the case of squares, just based on the wildness at times of the music and the raucousness of the music, it, it might in fact be intrusive in that. So my, my sense and the people that we've sold to, this, the general consensus is to choose the other, but it's as simple as pulling the plug and moving it over one jack. Absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Uh, let me mention one other apparatus that was not mentioned before. This is referred to as a telecoil neck loop. There are many people who wear telecoil hearing aids. And what this does is it goes around their neck and they plug it in into the earphone jack, in, you know, into the plug that you've plugged your earphone in, and it broadcasts up to the telecoil hearing aid. The, or, the, your audiologist can tell you or your, or your uh, dancer's uh, uh, audiologist can tell them whether or not they have a telecoil hearing aid, and they sometimes have to have a little micro switch on it to flip it to receive this broadcast. I had one customer who literally had a switchable telecoil circuit put into his hearing aid so that he could take advantage of this neck loop because when he took his hearing aids out, he really was stone deaf. I mean, he really didn't hear anything, and their decision was not to remove the hearing aid but to deal with it using this. It cost them hundred, two hundred dollars, I don't know what the fee was from the audiologist. But once again, if somebody's highly motivated to do it, that, that hundred dollar expenditure couldn't couldn't be much of a roadblock if they're really serious about it. You know, when they pull up in their seventy four thousand dollar Winnebago, uh, you know, towed towed <laughs> towed by their twenty nine thousand dollar Ford Ranger or whatever it might be, you know, with the three ninety nine engine in it. because uh, uh, that that is the reality that a lot of the people really are, are quite willing to spend a, a few extra dollars on it. But this is very simple. This is for a limited segment obviously those who have the telecoil hearing aid. And a lot, of, a lot of hearing aids are not that. I'm not an audiologist, and I don't know all of the other technical terms, but it's a percentage of that. Great. Uh, Doreen asks a very good question. Who's had experiences either themselves or with their dancers, either A, using the equipment or discussions that might have taken place about how useful or what, what the desires might have been? Any comments from the floor? A quiet group today. It's... Are you, are you impressed with the clarity of the sound? Yeah. And we're, we're being very, obviously, this is a very quiet room. It, it's perhaps a little bit exaggerated in here. There, there, are, there aren't 400 dancers standing around the per perimeter. Hmm? Yeah, believe it or not, we're the world's largest record dealer. And I actually don't have a record with me. Does anybody have a record? <laughs> it's, it's, it's embarrassing. Question. But, oh, surely, if you want to walk a distance, absolutely. Uh, by the way, Carl Smith, the National Executive Committee, we have made a motion. Oh, here. Sorry. Yeah, Carl's with the National Executive Committee. He, in fact, he's the chairman. And um, we've made a resolution this morning that we, in rough terms, will ask the conventions now to start providing this equipment at all conventions. And we're hoping to approach Round Lab and Color Lab, hopefully, that we'll have these things available at all dancing events. And that's the very rough resolution. Jack is the one that's worded it, and he's going to f finish it up for me. Okay, yeah, I'll let, I'll let 
Okay, let, let me just address this first, and uh, Doyne has brought up a, a very interesting point, which I'm going to let his wife address. We're queuing up a record here. Run about to the park, say hi to the corner. No, it's not coming through at this point. I'm just giving you some music as if it were hall music. You and Alaman left on the corner, and a right and left brand, hand over hand you go. Meet your own and promenade. Hit the bulls, wheel around to go up to the middle and back. And a right and left do Lady Lee for Dixie style. And the boys cross hold, touch your border, scoot back. Boy, run around the girl. Pass through with the wheel and deal, okay? Sorry, I didn't mean to mess up the audio there. <laughs> uh, the, uh, did everybody hear the, the voice clearly? Once again, I was not driving the, the music very loudly for the obvious reason, but you can still hear that. Let me, I don't have a Y chord to join them together, uh, unless you happen to have one. I, I didn't bring a Y chord. Uh, let me do this. I'm going to put it to the music only. Turn the front side of your cassette. Please turn your tape over and be... You have music in there now. Four ladies promenade to go one time to go round. Get back, swing. And you can't hear my voice. You're hearing it only from the speakers. I, I understand. I understand. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, could I ask you to... Jump up to the microphone here in the center. This is Lynn Anfinson, is a caller from New Jersey. Could you just repeat for everybody here the comment that your dancer made uh, a month ago, a week ago, whatever it might have been? Okay. Lynn Anfinson from New Jersey. Uh, club that I belong to and call for occasionally, Valley Squares, has a member who just dropped out a couple of years ago because he couldn't hear. Uh, got some information on the sound enhancement and. Uh, and convinced Bill to send me uh, some information. I talked to, to fellow Bill who had the problem. Uh, he bought a Telex unit from Bill Hyman, tried it, and uh, the result was amazing. I danced the first tip with this guy. He had danced in two years, and it's just you just could not believe the look on his face and the satisfaction because he, he could dance again. There were three things that, he, that meant anything to him. He was in his 70s. One was golf, one was bridge, and one was square dancing. And with square dancing out, he was really in a bind. So, uh, And what I did, I made up a bunch of different chords for him so he can use it with the old uh, Jones plugs. He can use it with any type of unit now. So, And also writing up a bunch of instructions so he has no trouble hooking it up to different sets. I tell you, it makes a big, big difference. Thank you very much. You went a ways out, I assume. Yeah, yeah you can go. I've gone, I've gone more than a haul away at the National and still gotten the signal quite quite adequately. Could you address uh, hooking up this system, uh, your husband asked, hooking up the system to non-Hilton systems? Yes. Hilton comes with a phono, phono plug at, in both ends. Now, it doesn't work this way. You have to have a phono jack on one end and the phono plug on the other end. Is that how I, is that's right now, isn't it? This yeah. Is RCA phono to RCA phono. Yeah. And so my system my system go has a voice and the music. And it works beautifully because I do not fool around with the controls. And um, and this way I Hilton uh, loaned me a cord because I don't have my cords from home. I just um, clicked. And it works. You'll have to try each system. If you don't have Hilton, you don't have a Grand. I haven't tried it with the Ashton, have you? I have not. It works the same way. Yeah. Same it's, as Hilton. It's an RCA. It's an RCA output. <coughs> but it's just sheer pleasure to see the faces of people who can hear to square dance and round dance. It's just like, wow. That's great. Um, let me talk a little bit, just mention the literature that, that we have. Uh, you've already received the one sheet uh, that I had printed up, which is just a, a, a what, why, where, and how of, of uh, wireless systems. I should also point out to you that one of the great services uh, that the Sound Enhancement Committee did was to standardize the frequencies 
on which we as a community would operate because it really takes a lot of the decision making away from individual groups or regionalization so that we now have a nationally advertised frequency. It happens to appear in our catalog. It's in other people's uh, uh, um, uh, catalogs and information and so forth. And I printed both of those frequencies on the back of the the uh, Cola Lab logo on the back here. Once again, I, I did do a little bit of graphic design work on it to clean up some of the rough edges. Uh, I should mention to you, in all fairness to everybody, there are currently, to the best of my knowledge, three vendors in this market who are currently sell, actively selling sound enhancement systems. There's uh, Peggy and myself. We are Supreme Audio, Handhurst Tape and Record Service. There is Hilton Audio, of course, who's been a Telex dealer for years and years. And there's also Johnny Wyckoff down at Murbach in Texas. Johnny's been selling the Williams Sound System since I think long before I was involved in calling, quite frankly, uh, since at least the late 70s uh, with Norman Murbach uh, long before him when, uh, from, uh, uh, when Johnny bought the company several years ago. So they've been selling the Williams for a long, long time now, and they're, they're quite familiar with it and certainly competent to, to give you good information and good advice. Um, are there any further questions from the floor? I don't want to... I want to belabor the point, but uh, we've covered a lot of information here. I think that you've seen by personally experiencing it, how clear the sound is. It really is like somebody talking in your ear. You have individual personal control over your volume level, that which is comfortable for you. I think that is a, a major advantage. It is lightweight. Uh, there is a vinyl belt clip belt pouch that, that can be purchased there about $6. Uh, that generally the men tend to slide those into their shirt sleeve pocket or into a side side or back pocket and let the wire go down their back. It seems to be the favorite way to do it. Uh, yeah, string it through the clothes, go into the men's room, sort of wire it through there and have it come out, come out your shirt tails and all that. But uh, keeping the wire out of arm's reach certainly is helpful so that it doesn't get caught if, a, if somebody brushes by with a thumb or a piece of jewelry or something so that it doesn't get caught there. No, okay. No, no, that's... If anybody wants copies of what I said, I've got some copies of Hey. Are the, Jack. Let me just mention uh, one other way to wire into the Hilton equipment, and this is my own uh, preferable way. We don't usually use the monitor circuit on our sets when we're calling. And uh, Hilton has a patch cord that you can get for about $16 that will allow you to hook into his speaker channels on the monitor circuit. Uh, the other hook-ins here for tape recorders are not controllable by you. They produce whatever they produce and send it out. The monitor circuit you can control. And our dancers prefer to uh, have both music and voice in their uh, system. So I can generally set on my monitor circuit, I can set uh, a voice about 9 or 10 o'clock and music at about... Um, uh, 25 to something like that and that stays constant no matter what else anybody does with the other circuits those channels continue to produce at that and once they set their sound receiver uh, they can dance any place and they don't have to change it and so um, that's another thing but uh, Hilton prefers that you not plug into the speaker channels without utilizing a patch cord that he puts uh, together. And then that patch cord goes directly in to uh, the transmitter, replaces the connections here. The other transmitters were the old, uh, what kind are they, the three-prong? XLR. XLR, yeah. And, uh, and my, of course, my speaker, I haven't changed, so I still have the Cinch Jones uh, connector on mine. Just another option uh, for people who uh, prefer that one or would like to use it. Thank you for the comments, Jack. Any other questions or comments? Doreen, another comment? Just that if you have any comments after you leave this convention and you want to tell me, please, please send them to me. Because we're most anxious to find out about your experience, find out about your questions, and about any answers you have that we haven't even asked the questions of. I would really like to hear, and the committee would. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of you for your participation today. I hope it's been informative. Once again, follow up with any of us or all of us. And we thank you very much and go out and spread the word. It's a, it's a great system and your dancers are going to love you for it. And if you would just turn in all of the borrowed equipment back to Doreen. And thanks again to Doreen. Yeah. <laughs>